In this lesson, we're going to look at the heart and circulation. Firstly, we're going to describe the structure and function of the heart, then describe the main components of blood and their function, and then explain how the blood vessels are adapted for transporting blood. Learning about the heart is biology at its most basic, in that you are stating a part of the body, then you're saying how its structure helps it perform its function. Now, it's hard to know where to begin with the heart because there's so much to say about it, but I thought I'd condense it into a few sort of fun facts. So this is my hand doing an impression of a heart. Unfortunately, I've had to put this on loop because there's no way I could continue to contract my hand. You see, the muscles that make up my hand would fatigue very quickly. So why is it that the heart can continue to contract throughout your lifetime without fatiguing, without getting tired? Well, the heart is made from a special type of muscle called cardiac muscle. And how cardiac muscle is different to normal muscle is that it contains far more mitochondria and it has its own artery called the coronary artery which supplies heart cells with blood. This enables them to get enough energy through respiration to contract without becoming fatigued. What's also interesting is the heart is myogenic. That means it has its own nervous system. So quite literally, if you rip someone's heart out of their chest, it would still be beating. In some cultures, it is tradition to consume the still beating heart of a recently killed animal. You can roughly estimate the size of your heart by clasping two hands together. Every minute, your heart pumps around roughly seven litres of blood around your body. This is what it would look like. If you had to award a trophy to the animal with the biggest heart, the land animal would be the giraffe. If you think about it, their heart has to be huge to pump their blood up against gravity to their brain. And of course, the mighty blue whale, whose heart is about the size of a car. In fact, their heart is so big that you could crawl through their aorta, the biggest artery in the circulatory system. Let's jump right in by looking at heart structure and function. Now, I'm sure you're very familiar with the heart dissection practical, which you basically cut a heart in heart and try and identify the part, which is a lot harder to do when you're actually looking at heart than when you're looking at a diagram. So this is the basic setup of the circulatory system. You have your heart as the central pump. The heart will pump blood to the lungs to get oxygenated and then it will return to the heart. Then the heart will pump it again to the rest of the body, the brain, the feet, the liver, the kidneys, everywhere else. And then it returns back to the heart. But what's going on inside the heart? So let's do our own little dissection. So first you'll notice the heart is divided into four distinct chambers. The upper chambers are called the atria and the lower chambers are called the ventricles. You can remember this by their shape. If you look, the atria kind of look like A's over here and the ventricles look like V's over here. One atria is called an atrium and a ventricle is still called a ventricle. The first important thing you must understand is the heart is flipped in a diagram. So the right side is actually your left side and the left side is your right side. There are four main blood vessels linked to the heart, two of which are veins, the vena cava, which is the largest vein in the body, and the pulmonary vein, and two of which are arteries, the pulmonary artery and the aorta, the largest artery in the body. Pulmonary tells you that these blood vessels travel to and from the lungs. You also note that the heart has four sets of valves. Valves are like trap doors and they're linked by tendons to the interior walls of the heart. Valves can open in one direction but not the other direction. This ensures that blood continually moves in one direction through the heart. So normally we'd be talking about blood filling up these chambers, but just to help you understand the passageway blood takes, I'm going to focus on the journey of one red blood cell. So firstly, red blood cell arrives via the vena cava and enters the right atrium. As the right atrium starts to fill up with blood, it exerts a pressure on these valves and eventually the valves fling open. This happens in conjunction with the atrial walls contracting. The other atria will also be contracting at the same time. This forces our red blood cell through into the right ventricle. The atria then relax. And now we look at the ventricles. So now it's time for the ventricle walls to contract. And this has two effects. Firstly, it causes these valves to shut. Because remember, they're only one way and that prevents backflow of blood. It's very important. Blood continues moving in one direction. Secondly, that red blood cell will move towards this blood vessel here, the pulmonary artery. The pressure from the blood being forced against these valves causes them to open. And the ventricles relax. These valves are called atrioventricular valves or AV valves. And these valves are called semilunar valves. These would be the right AV valves and these would be the left AV valves. 
Our red blood cell then enters a roller coaster ride around the circulatory system. It travels from the pulmonary artery away from the heart to the lungs. Now, all arteries transport blood away from the heart, but only the pulmonary artery transports deoxygenated blood away from the heart. And that's because it's transporting it to the lungs to pick up oxygen. So our red blood cell has picked up oxygen from the lungs and can now continue along its journey. If you remember, that happens in the alveoli. So now our oxygenated blood and oxygenated red blood cell will travel along the pulmonary vein. Veins always travel to the heart, but the pulmonary vein is the only vein which transports oxygenated blood towards the heart. All other veins transport deoxygenated blood. Deoxygenated blood carries low levels of oxygen and as a result has a different colour. It is a purplish sort of colour as opposed to bright vivid red. So let's review. Firstly, red blood cells enter the atria via the vena cava and pulmonary vein. The right atrium will contain deoxygenated red blood cells because they're returning from the body and the left atrium will contain oxygenated red blood cells because they're returning from the lungs. Now, the atria contract and this forces blood into the ventricles. At the same time, the AV valves are forced open as blood pours through. Now there's a key learning point here. The left ventricle contains the thickest muscular wall in the heart. This is because the left ventricle has to transport blood all around the body, all the way up to the brain against gravity and all the way down to the feet, whereas the right ventricle only has to transport blood to the lungs, which are very close to the heart. So now it's the ventricle's turn to contract, and as a consequence, the AV valves slam shut and the semilunar valves open. This allows blood to leave the heart via the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Red blood cells traveling along the pulmonary artery will reach the lungs where they pick up oxygen, and then they return to the heart via the pulmonary vein, back to the heart, whereas red blood cells leaving via the aorta will travel to the other parts of the body, the kidney, the liver, the brain, etc. When they get there, they will transfer their oxygen to cells for respiration, and then the red blood cell will return to the heart via the vena cava. And remember, it will be deoxygenated. And that completes one round of the cardiac cycle. Here's a summary of the key adaptations you need to be able to explain. And this could be a six mark question. Firstly, the heart has valves to prevent the backflow of blood. So blood continues to travel in one direction only, highly organized. Secondly, the left ventricle wall is the thickest, this wall here, as it has more muscle needed to pump blood around the whole body, not just the lungs. The heart is referred to as a double pump, and that's because it pumps blood to the lungs first, then back to the heart, then to the rest of the body, then back to the heart. This is to ensure that the blood pressure remains high. You see, if the blood went to the lungs and then from the lungs to the rest of the body, it would lose so much pressure that blood circulation would be very slow and we would not deliver oxygen and glucose fast enough for survival. Finally, the septum separates oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. The septum is the division that separates the chambers. It's very important that oxygenated and deoxygenated blood do not mix because if they did, with every contraction, we'd be sending less oxygen around the body. This would lower the rate of respiration and we'd feel tired and lethargic. Exercise would be extremely difficult. Some people are born with a hole in their heart. This is what we mean by hole in the heart, a hole in the septum. This causes the blood to mix and therefore, as I just said, their rate of respiration will not be as high as someone without a hole in their heart. This could come up as an application question, so it's worth knowing. So that is how you describe the structure and function of the heart. So now let's explain the function of the different components of blood. Blood is an organ made of different tissues. These tissues work together to perform a similar function. That function being transporting valuable materials around the body. There are four components of blood you need to be able to explain. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets and plasma. Let's look at red blood cells first. Inside each red blood cell, you'll find 280 million molecules of a protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin contains four units, if you like, and each unit contains an iron atom. This is why we need iron in our diet. Iron is used to transport oxygen. Every hemoglobin molecule will transport four molecules of oxygen, which will affiliate with each iron atom. A lack of iron in your diet can cause a condition called anemia, very common in girls, due to the menstrual cycle. Anemia can cause you to feel tired and lethargic, basically because you're not carrying as much oxygen for respiration. The main adaptations of the red blood cell are, firstly, it's biconcave in shape. It caves in on both sides. This means it's flat so it can easily fit down capillaries and it has a large surface area for 
oxygen absorption. In other words, oxygen absorption will be rapid. This is my abbreviation, don't use it in an exam. As I've already said, it's packed with a protein called hemoglobin, which contains iron to carry oxygen. Once oxygen has bonded with hemoglobin, we call it oxyhemoglobin. And finally, the red blood cell actually ejects its nucleus to make more space for carrying oxygen. You see, a red blood cell is an excellent example of a specialised cell. It's geared towards carrying oxygen. So that's red blood cells. Now let's look at white blood cells. White blood cells have the ability to change their shape to engulf pathogens. This is when their membrane forms a seal around an invading microorganism like a bacteria or fungi. And once they're sealed in this little capsule, digestive enzymes break them apart. This process is called phagocytosis, though you don't need to know that for this exam. They also produce antibodies and antitoxins. Antibodies are basically proteins which have a complementary shape, a bit like enzymes and substrates, but to the antigens, cell markers on invading bacteria. Once they bond to these antigens on the bacteria, they bring about their destruction. Also, bacteria can produce chemicals called toxins, and white blood cells can produce antitoxins to neutralize the harmful toxins. If you have a low white blood cell count, you're more at risk of infection. Whereas if you have a very high white blood cell count, it could be an indicator of leukemia because leukemia is cancer of the blood cells. And if you remember, cancer is uncontrollable cell division. So now let's look at platelets. Platelets are basically mashed up cell fragments which help the blood to clot around a wound. You see they have an irregular shape. And this irregular shape makes it very easy for them to cling to each other, forming a seal. This enables a scab to form to allow the wound to heal, but also stops further invasion by microorganisms. People who have a low platelet count may bleed excessively when cut. So finally, let's look at the plasma. Plasma is the watery, yellow, pale, fluid part of blood, and it's useful for two things. Firstly, transporting useful materials to cells, such as red blood cells, which carry oxygen, white blood cells, which fight disease, platelets, which help us clot our blood, glucose, amino acids, hormones, antibodies, and antitoxins. They also transport waste materials, which are made from cells, away from cells, such as carbon dioxide and urea. You are required to know what plasma transports, so learn these. And that's how you explain the function of the four components of blood. And again, that could be a six marker. And that is how you describe the main components of blood and their function. So in the last part of our journey of say what you see, then explain what it does, we're looking at blood vessel adaptations. There are three types of blood vessels that make up your circulatory system that you need to know. You have arteries, which transport blood away from the heart. These then branch out into capillaries, tiny one-cell thick blood vessels which deliver vital ingredients to cells for respiration, as well as other things. And then capillaries remove waste materials from cells and transport blood to veins which return it to the heart. Each of these blood vessels is distinctly different to help it perform its slightly different job. Arteries always carry blood away from the heart. It's usually oxygenated, but not the pulmonary artery, which transports it to the lungs from the heart. Arteries transport blood under very high pressure, and this is maintained by the fact that arteries have a pulse. Arteries are usually buried deep down under your skin, because if you cut an artery, even though it only carries about 20% of your blood at any one time, if an artery was severed for some reason, then blood would leave at such a force that you would lose blood very quickly, and you'd need immediate medical attention. Because blood is transported under very high pressure, arteries have a very thick muscular wall, as you can see here. They're very elastic as well, so they can stretch and withstand that pressure. You see, if you have a very unhealthy diet, very fatty diet, then your arteries start to harden. This increases the chances of them ripping and tearing. Arteries also have a small hollow space which blood travels through called the lumen. This also makes sure that pressure remains high. Veins, on the other hand, always carry blood to the heart. Remember, arteries, A, for away from the heart, and veins to the heart. They usually transport deoxygenated blood, except for the pulmonary vein, which transports blood from the lungs back to the heart. Blood is transported under low pressure in veins, and therefore they have thinner muscular walls because they don't need to withstand high pressures. They also have a large lumen to allow more blood through to help blood flow, but because of the low pressure, they have valves to prevent backflow of blood. That's what these flaps are here. They're valves, but looking from above. So they get smaller and bigger as blood goes through. So as blood travels through, the valves shut behind it to prevent backflow of blood. Also, due to a lack of pulse, 
Veins require muscular contractions from our normal body muscles around the veins to squeeze the blood through. This is why on long flights it's very important to wiggle your feet so that the blood in your legs, which has to work hard against gravity, keeps churning. You see blood because the platelets is very sticky and if you leave it still for too long it will clump together forming blood clots. So you've got to keep it moving. Capillaries are only one cell thick. They're tiny. They transport blood to cells from arteries and transport waste away from cells to veins. They are very thin, they are only one cell thick, the walls, and the walls are permeable. They can actually open slightly and close to allow things through. This allows for rapid diffusion of important substances, whether it's useful materials or waste materials. So once again, this could be a six marker quite easily. Uh, so just make sure you know how these blood vessels are adapted for transporting blood and how they are different from each other. Remember, arteries away, then capillaries to the cells, and then veins back to the heart. And that's how you explain how the blood vessels are adapted for transporting blood.